Welcome to a lovely episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce you to Victoria Pelletier. She's a C-suite transformational leader, speaker, and an author of one book and two upcoming. But more interestingly, by the time Victoria was 24 years old, she was already CEO of multinational corporation. So I'd love to hear that story. And now, 20 years plus later, with leadership at uh, companies like Accenture, IBM, American Express. Victoria is um, sharing some of her hard-worn lessons about how to build a personal brand and how to be a wholly aligned leader. So welcome to the pod, Victoria. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, I love one quote from the Unstoppable book uh, that you've written, which is, you don't have to possess a golden pedigree to be unstoppable. In my opinion, the key to being unstoppable is to leverage the lessons and calluses we acquire in the craziness, using them for fuel, uh, to fuel our desire to learn, to earn, to lead, and to make our mark on the world. So basically a very stoic approach where the obstacle is the way. And, um, you know, I am personally, as an entrepreneur, learning that that is the sort of the muscle that I need to keep coming back on a regular basis. So tell us a little bit about how do you bring that in the corporate America where that's not necessarily kind of, you know, unless you're in sales, perhaps that's not necessarily the mindset that everybody brings in. I'd love to hear kind of what, what inspired that quote and how are you applying it in, you know, in your, throughout your career? I, um, the, my lived experience, the adversity and the obstacles that I faced are a big part of what I refer to as my why. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I overcame a lot in my youth and I feel like that's what fueled me. I remember my my mom and I'm adopted uh, and my so my my adopted mother, that my mom's the one that raised me. She said to me at probably 11 or 12, she's like, you know, Tori, you need to do better than us. And she meant socioeconomically. She meant vocationally. She was a secretary. My dad was a janitor. Uh, and I don't think she had to say those things to me because the trauma that I'd experienced in my youth prior to her adopting me and in circumstance, that's a big part of my why. And so the you know lines you read from the book are very much around how do you leverage the, whether it is an obstacle or adversity or any failure or learning towards like opportunity. I think if we're not leaning into things that make us uncomfortable, the growth and development is not going to come. So that's how I've chosen to apply in the corporate world that I've lived in for the last 30 something years mm -hmm. uh, to fuel my success, my team success. And I try and get them to lean much more into, again, their whole selves that show up at work every day. So this is really fascinating, and I'm, I'm really intrigued that you brought up this age of 11, 12 years old. Uh, it seems that on the, on, the, on the podcast, we do try to really dig into deeper human issues, right? I know, like, what is, what, how do we bring our whole self into our work environments, into our communications? And this age seems to be fundamental. I could relate personally. That was around the age when I experienced Chernobyl disaster when we had to evacuate from Soviet Kiev into into you know another city uh, and then later kind of a refugee into the United States and and that that period you know was way tougher than pretty much anything you encounter in a startup journey or you know corporate um, you know whatever corporate misadventures which may seem important at the time. But like you look at them in retrospect, right? There is not that much danger going on. And so I hear a lot of people going back to that formative experience when they overcome a challenge. What what's you know, it sounds like that's part of your journey. What are you, how are you helping people like go identify that? Because a lot of people try to forget their childhood or are like living unconsciously. Um, what's your take on that? I, uh, I spent a lot of time talking about resilience. And for me, um, you know, people will often ask, like, is it just DNA, like nature, nurture? And I think personally, it's both. And I know that innately for me, there's something in my DNA. When you think of fight or flight, I am a fighter. 
And mm. so that's the part that can't change. What the muscle that I've developed and the nurture component of it, and this is where I spend time talking to people, is to work through a healthy way of being resilient. I don't think I actually always had the healthiest way. I had an extreme ability to compartmentalize, um, which mm. still helps sometimes even to this day, uh, but I never really processed the feelings or the emotions that you know I, I had or whatever the experience was. And so for me, this journey towards a healthy level of being resilient is, first of all, be, be really clear on what your goal or objective is. Personally, mm. professionally, from a health perspective, whatever, just get very clear on what the, the, the goal and ob or objective is for yourself. The next is start to model the thinking, the acts, the behavior that take you towards or learning that take you towards that goal or objective. Being very self-reflective and self-aware, mm. uh, you know, through that, like what's going to get me there? For me, like I know I will often be triggered with some kind of, I'm very fast to emotion and I'm very good professionally at masking that. Personally, not so much so. My poor husband and children sometimes need to like mm -hmm. see a little bit more of that as that comes up. But that self-awareness, like where's that coming from? Is it fear? Um, mm. Like, and then being able to, as I said, go with that through that, the modeling, the thoughts, action and, and, and behavior to take me to a more positive place where I want to go. I, the next would actually be giving myself permission to fail. Mm. Uh, being okay with that, you know, progress is one foot in front of the other, you know, taking one step at a time and sometimes means taking a step back and that's okay. And then anchoring so, and going back to that start and, and going through that, that process all over again. So this is, this is really interesting. Like, so when, if you kind of extrapolate this, I'm a fighter phenomenon, right? Like, which, which is great if, if there is a situation that requires that, but sometimes the other person just needs to be heard, just needs to be understood. If it's a child, they're not aware of what's going on for them. So fighting with a child obviously is not something that is as easy. So I'm, I'm dealing with some of these things in my own uh, personal uh, growth. And what I'm finding is that there is definitely a parallel between a react, the way you react to certain things at work. You may mask it a little bit more um, because I think sometimes we are um, tougher on people that are near to us than the ones that are kind of in the, in a more hierarchical or I don't know if hierarchical is the right word, but in the more formal social structures, I think there are different norms perhaps. Um, and, but the, there's a step of like creating a pause, right? Between a stimulus of what you're getting and then kind of processing it, I ideally processing it the way it helps to kind of understand the other person's perspective and so on. And, and I find that the work at home improves uh, my, my ability to connect with people at work and vice versa. I think so, like sometimes, you know, work challenges, you know, puts things in perspective when, when you see challenges at home and you don't react to them. Walk me through that a little bit, how, you know, because you brought up, brought up this is an important topic. I think everybody is frankly struggling with this. Nobody's perfect. And the more successful you are in one sphere, probably the more you start to overuse certain things that work in that sphere and then bring that over. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, you've written books on this topic. You've, um, you know, you work with other high performers. What are you seeing that people um, carry over the positives from work into home and vice versa? Well, I think um, we need to, I mean, recognize we are whole humans. And that's actually why I entitled this leadership book I have coming out, Whole Human Leadership. And recognize like the ability to to create that division and separate is, is difficult. I did mention the ability to compartmentalize. And I do think yeah. we need the ability to do that to some extent, but it's like recognizing we are the whole people who, sh who show up every day at work or when it's at home and we're supposedly off the clock. Although I don't know who's ever actually off the clock and COVID uh, showed us that as we all work remotely from our homes, like it, the ability to turn that switch off is very difficult. And so Instead, I say embrace it. That's, that's also why I hate the question, how do you do it all as though, again, there's a separation in my life between, you know, be, being wife, mother, 
you know, a, an athlete, a executive, a speaker, a board member, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I, I fit it all in. And that, I think we need to think a lot more in that regard. And the other thing is you said you feel a greater connectedness to people that you've been able to establish while working remotely. I think it's important to recognize that people are different. And so some have found great benefit in, in remote, whereas others who are super social animals still want the in-person. And for many of us, like myself, I'm very good with hybrid. I want face-to-face, -face, but sometimes when I just want that silence to sit here, like sit, sit and be on back-to-back -back Zoom calls, I'd rather do that, you know, from the comfort of my home office than doing that, um, you know, in a physical office somewhere and still not engaging with people except through. So I think it's just I go back to sort of self-awareness and reflection and and that and that coupled with the in integration and recognizing that it's okay that we are whole humans that show up and should be comfortable and safe showing up authentically their whole selves, the lived experience they bring to the workplace and vice versa. So how do you so so let's dive into that topic that you brought up in particular of the balance, right? Like is that a doesn't it does it like is it balancing out does it even work right there's a sort of expectations that we've got to do it all are there times that we have to deprioritize some things and prioritize other things and so the the whole concept of balance gets you in trouble um a lot of people i think ide like ideally feel um that they're dropping one of the balls, right? Like there's there's five of them and you name yours, right? And, you know, there are probably days when you get it all perfect. And then there are days when, you know, something gets, has to drop. And maybe you brought, drop it intentionally. Guide us a little bit through, you know, what do you see people do in this, right? Like how do they, how do they process it so it's healthy so you don't feel, oh, I'm guilt, I'm a bad parent today and you know you know and so start punishing yourself and getting in a negative spiral because the trade-offs are probably core part of life anybody trying to do something meaningful and, and significant yeah i um you use the word trade-off and i think that that's really important and so i do think that we need to you know for me i think you you can have it all not always at the same time and i do think it's important to give yourself permission to recognize that you're going to have make, to make decisions and trade-offs. And that doesn't mean I haven't felt guilty as a mother. I think of when my younger one was only two years old. I remember that year, more for tax purposes at the recording of it, I spent 220 days on the road. Wow. And then I would come home and like, I'd realized what I'd missed in that week, you know, and my younger Jordan was like, would, would be speaking in full sentences. I, I have my own mom guilt. That's the other thing. Don't let other people make you feel guilty for that. My career has always been very important to me and being a mother is important to me. And so, yes, I've occasionally felt guilty, probably on more than a, an occasion, but I do give myself permission and recognize that there's trade-offs and compromise that need to be made. And I hope that you you make the decision that's right for you in the moment. Um, I think of, you know, years ago when my ex passed away and I became a, although we were divorced, but a single parent to parent children, that mm. was a time where I made a decision career-wise in leaving a role I loved, but had me on the road 80, 90% of the time to find one that had me, you know, home-based much more minimal 10% travel. I didn't mm -hmm. love the job. Much, but that was the right decision at that point. And so we will make those decisions that are right for a combination of family um, and career, personal health and growth, um, and, and make these compromises. What I will say, though, Alex, is for me, I where there's conviction, there's capacity. And so I live a life of no excuses. It's one of the hashtags I sign off a lot. So there's, you know, for those who want to, whether it's get healthy or they want to start their passion project, there's the nine to five and then there's the five to nine. If you're going to spend the night Netflixing, um, right. then that's, cho that's a choice. And that's where I will like challenge and push people back. Interesting. And speaking of high performance, one of the quotes that you brought up is that of Bruce Lee in one of your articles. Um, and and it it's it really resonated with me. It says, absorb what is useful, 
reject what is useless, add what is specifically your own. And it sounds like I just heard you do that, you know, where you're saying, hey, I am going to make the right trade offs, but certain things like Netflix, right? I'm going to like get it out because this is just not, this is not a priority in my life, right? And, you know, I'll allocate. And then, and then you're, you're, you wrote, you're writing a book. I think it's, it's about to go out on, on personal branding, which is actually maybe a, a communication step of figuring out what it is that you stand for. So I'm, I'm really curious, you know, what, what have you learned from, from both writing the book and then obviously applying that in your own life as a speaker and, you know, mixing that was a, you know, successful corporate career. And I'm really um, finding that even in the context of this podcast, when we're discussing, right, like we have, a you know, two or three very, you know, to me, very adjacent topics, but like people, many people would say, well, entrepreneurial, marketing, techie combos, not necessarily like the way everybody thinks and what everybody cares about. So we're trying in the podcast to, in fact, create um, a place for an audience that shares some of the same passions, uh, but it's it's hard. It's not a clear cut, you know, niche identify, like highly identifiable. And so I'm really curious kind of what at some point when you communicate to others who you are and what you stand for, do you just kind of take out the whole thing or do you have to go and do do some cleanup to make it easier for people to digest? Oh, well, that, that there's a lot there in terms of where I would I would go. So first of all, I'll tell you, I've been working on my personal brand for well over 20 years. I don't even know that I had the vernacular back then to call it that. But when I made the shift from like banking, which is where I where I worked when I was in university to the world of business to business, professional services, where you're competing through things like RFPs and, and, and how much relationships matter. That was when I sort of started to shift. How do I create differentiation, not only for, for, for the organization I'm working for and my team that are what we call the go to market commercially, you know, client focused and myself. So one, that's where it began. And so th there's no like quick fix, if you will. It's a journey from a brand mm. perspective. And to your question, do you change it? I, I actually will tell you, I've had to pivot and change over time. What I mm. wanted 20 something years ago and my definition of success, which then in my 20s as a young executive was more around hierarchy, greater scope of res responsibility, greater compensation. That's sure that those are still measures that you know people use, but that's not how I measure my success now. So my brand and my story has evolved, one. Two, I did have to do a course correction. Um, because I was a young female executive, I showed up in a very particular way. I was not going to show you that I'm vulnerable or emotional. And I had a nickname as the Iron Maiden. Well, that's actually not at all who mm. I am. So mm. I had to course correct, um, mm. both in how I showed up every day in person, but certainly much, much more broadly than that. So I, I say that your brand is like four pieces. The one that everyone seems to, it's the easy part what what do you do what are you known for what did you what, what are you a subject matter expert in what did you go to school for that kind of thing that's where most people stop though then it's mm -hmm. storytelling who are you the person passions interests values those things next how are you different from other people who do what you do and the last is connecting to legacy and impact what do you want to be known for and so for me you know the sales and revenue and profitability and the mergers and acquisitions i've done that's not how i want to be known when i die It'll be one slice of it around the impact is around one. Did I raise two really good humans? Did I leave the workplaces, the community and the world a better place than, you know, when I left them, when I came into it, things like that. And the last thing to, to one of your questions is know your audience. So how, like, what's your objective for connecting with that audience? And therefore that's when you choose what parts of you, it's always the authentic you, but like, what are you going to share on this platform? How do you show up in a different platform for maybe a slightly different audience? So it's way more complicated um, and you need to be like planful. I, I use the phrase strategically intentional around how you're going to build that brand and how you're going to show up. Look, I really like that you brought this up because I think some people have a, um stigma associated with the word personal branding. 
and um because it it feels brand branding right the the you know it's like some sort of a stamp somewhere right like it's a you know it is a marketing term but you brought up something that's fundamental um in and that is either you know another rephrasing of a book by david brooks uh which kind of cup cap from a which captures the difference between a resume resume values and eulogy values right like what do people say about your resume which is sort of let's say not full personal branding but uh, you know some might be perceived like a personal branding type of thing and then like fundamentally what are you about what's your purpose in life what are, you know how do you what do you want to accomplish um so let's dive into that a little bit uh, the, i think the very few people um i think when they come up with their personal brand go all the way back into their you know eulogy and try to craft out you know what is what is what are what are people going to say say about that and and i think m- maybe there's a fear right because if you do that it will take you away from hardcore driving breaking through the walls in some sort of professional context that you may not particularly be you know, as passionate about as, you know, your need to prove or I'll go up the ladder or kind of keep improving. And I think it's very, it must make people very uncomfortable. So what happens when you bring this up, right? And you share your own journey uh, with other folks around that, because, you know, achievers kind of just need to achieve, 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 typically don't have a little, you know, don't have the, the luxury almost to slow down and reflect of what's at the end of that achievement journey. And on the one hand, we want to leverage that, that person's inherent energy, but you know, are they going to be happy? Are they really achieving at their full potential in that mode? Or is actually a restricted potential because they haven't really unlocked the underlying meaning underneath that. It would be really curious to get your take on this. I think that, Effective um, personal branding requires courage and vulnerability and authenticity, and that scares the hell out of many people. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there is a a rack, a, 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 an act of courageousness in doing it and doing it well, and own your story. I mean, you can be a rags to riches, overcoming extreme adversity, and that and that's how I fueled it to become successful. You, you could be born with an incredible pedigree and not having any of those, but you've had some other really unique lived experiences that make you different and show up, you know, very um, wise and unique to the audience. you're choosing. So embrace it, whatever that story is, but you do have to get comfortable with a self-reflection. I go back to that again, around looking inward, around what what's making you uni- unique and different and in, embrace it fully. Um, at the end of the day, people do business with people they like and trust and want to do business with. And trust comes from the authenticity. It comes from the courageous act of sharing oneself, one's experience, one's emotions with others. Um, and I mean, I, I ran away from that for a long time. Um, I, you know, I write the book and I speak so openly about it now because I realize just like, it's truly, transformed my life, my career, and both personally and pref- professionally, quite honestly, um, in doing that. And so if I can share my story and what I've overcome, and if that helps someone, if it, it, a nugget of like courageousness to them because they saw me do it, then I'll do it time and time again. So let's be more specific about what that means. And I think you brought up a few examples at the very beginning, right? Because I- for, for example, in which, let's say we're getting to know each other in this sort of context, but there's a high stakes future relationship that we could be building, right? That where we need to get to know each other for real. What would you, let's say strategically or just in, in just generally in the spirit of being open, what would you share to elevate the relationship uh, to, to that level? Of consciousness, right? Because a lot of relationships, and, and I would say even the way 
before the call, I was like very much down to business. We're like, hey, we have 30 minutes. Do we have an hour? How much? Like it was sort of that mindset, right? And I think we all have that, right? We all need to operate in this sort of deadline driven, you know, uh, b- facts, uh, statistics type of world where, you know, there, sometimes there is not that. Uh, you know, afternoon in uh, Rome and Piazza where you could have an espresso and really get to the to the soul of the other person. And so um, guide us a little bit of how you're bring, able to bring that authenticity, whether it's yourself or other people that you've seen do this incredibly well so that our audience could be more human, uh, which is a uh, kind of key part of this podcast is how do we bring yeah. our humanity and shared experience with each other? Um, Let's say three tips that you would you would leave with uh, with us. Well, it's so funny you talked about this sort of down the business because my Iron Maiden came with me being all business all the time, and one of the pieces of being really intentional and starting to course correct was I took the first five minutes out of every meeting when I w- would walk in. Um, to just chit chat with people, which wasn't natural for me. Now, like I talk to strangers in elevators. I, it's now totally innate, but back mm-hmm. then it wasn't. And so I needed to, to be intentional around creating that space. Uh, and so uh, that would be tip number one, like being really intentional about how you're going to do that. The The next is around finding connections. You ask like, what, what would I choose to share? I try to quickly identify what that could be, you know, so a really easy one, quite honestly, is as parents to start to connect with people. Like I think of years ago, I was asked to take over this kind of troubled client portfolio. And then one of the most critical executives um, was not responding back to me at all. And by chance, we were in a hockey arena. We were hockey moms. Mm. That became this moment of connection and dramatically changed from there on out. We, again, we didn't connect in a work setting, um, but that we built that connection, this commonality as hockey moms, which then built a relationship and it was transformative to that troubled client portfolio. Um, Mm. But it can be something else. It can be, um, you know, I'm a member of the LGBT community. I came out as bisexual at 14, although at some point I think I said I was a lesbian because I was married to a woman for 11 years. And I'm just I'm very comfortable being on the spectrum now and I choose the word queer just means I'm Mm -hmm. not straight. And Mm -hmm. that can be it. Like if I get a sense from someone that I've got an acute sense of gaydar as they call it. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm very, um, uh, very feminine looking for the most part. And so people make assumptions around what that means. And so Mm -hmm. my ability to recognize um, if with someone that I think might be queer themselves that I can share openly about that. Well, that's mm. that's an open door. So figure out what that is. Again, I go mm. back to storytelling in your brand, um, passions, interests, values. And so f- find that. And then the last, the third tip, I guess, um, that you said you wanted three um, would be the little bit of the, the vulnerability piece. So mm. for me, earlier in building relationships pe- with people, once I've established some kind of commonality or connection with them is to show, is to build the trust. And that's by oftentimes sharing an, an element or something of myself that's a little bit more vulnerable because then it invites them to do the same and they know that they can trust me. But also connected to that, I I've, I operate with radical candor. This is the other way I, I build trust with people. And it can be depending on the, the meeting I'm in. So again, I could be vulnerable if I'm much more of a, of a casual setting with them. Or if I'm sitting in a meeting, I'm the type of person, I'm not going to tell someone what they want to hear. I'm going to tell them what they need to hear. And that too is bold because I'll tell you in the management consulting professional services world, there's far too many consultants who always tell clients what they want to hear. I am an outlier in being really mm. bold um, in challenging them uh, from a place of wanting them to hear what they need to. Hmm. So- so you're you're highlighting the like the benefits of this are obvious. What are the risks of you know going out and you know bringing out your 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 the fact that you're queer, right? Like does this make one person very comfortable? Somebody else doesn't know how to react, right? Let's say not uncomfortable, but certainly is not is you know depending on which geography you may be, you right. know, in that may be like a very new experience, and it could. Um, 
work wonders and it could also raise questions for people and and so similarly being like you said in consulting environment uh, you know, let's say you're doing consulting in UK, which I had to do at some point, right? And there it's like on top of being coded language of just being, you know, talking to folks in London where you need to, you know, have understated messages. Then there is a consulting, right? And then there is like, there's a humor that you need to bring into this to to avoid the horror of social embarrassment, which would kind of is what holds Britain together in some ways. So, so that has its risks, right? Being very direct and American, which I, I've you know probably stepped in a few uh, piles of my own making uh, of trouble. And so, I'm I'm really curious, you know, what? How do is this, is this? There's a lot of skill in this involved to doing it right and practice. Is it just go do it and you know learn over time? Like, what would be your advice on applying that in a in especially if you're new, right? If you're taking taking the first steps like I, I remember first time bringing up that you know my background was Jewish and at some point I had a, a very difficult you know anti-semitic incident and it was because I was I remember I was like I like when I described it in a public setting it was I felt like there was a weight uh that I was carrying for for years of some sort of need to be approved uh, like approval from being like 12 years old type of area. And, and it was, it was shocking, like how he heavy it was. Right. So not everybody is probably ready to, to take some of these leaps and like, how do you, how do you create, make careful steps so that it's, it's the right direction, uh, but uh, it doesn't end up in a, in a disaster. Um, It's, I, I mean, it's a, there's a learning curve. Uh, and so I go back to, to like, who and what do you want to be known as? So for right. me, I am a big part of my brand is connected to social justice and advocacy. And so I'm very openly, like when I worked for IBM, I was listed on their website as one of 30 out executives globally. That's it. Uh, and, but it, it it's, key to who I am as a human and the kind of workplaces and how I want to be seen as a leader and how I can help others. So figure that out. So it would be one and start with baby steps. So mm. although I was openly out, um, you know, 20 something years ago when I was with my, with my wife, I was cautious with clients. Mm. Uh, and I played the pronoun game back then. Oh, my, other half, my better half, you know, and, and or just you weren't explicit. Name. You weren't explicit. No. You, and you, and you it's know. not for those who work most closely with me, everyone would know. But right. because I wasn't sure of my audience yeah. from a from a business corporate client perspective, I was cautious. Uh, and so I just started to, you know, inch a little bit more into that until I was comfortable. So I would tell your listeners to, again, Connect to, to to your brand and what do you want to be known for, and then start to figure out the, those stories that that are really innate in, into who you are as a human now, um, and how you would want to be known. And start small. I mean, I when I told the story of my my childhood abuse, I'm born to a drug addicted teenage mother. Like I would tell that in like in small settings, and it wasn't until I one put it in a book. And two started standing on public stages that I gained so much more confidence doing it. And the rags to riches story, if you want to call it that, or you want to call it, you know, the resilience to success, whatever, like that is part of who I am now. And so I, but I did it on a small scale. So just lean in, lean into it, try it out, see what feels comfortable. And it gets a heck of a lot easier over time. And do you see as you get, as you vocalize this and share it, you know, more in public, that sort of, uh, you know, you would argue that escalates the commitment to the to the story, right? But at some point you mentioned that your story also had to change, right? The way you position yourself. So, so as you are out there publicly, let's say part of your identity, part of your vision for yourself changes through life. That's just normal. How easy is it to go back on something you've been public on, right? Like to an own, hey, like that was me two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. I'm a different person now, 
right? Do you, is, is that a, um, cause there's a risk to this, right? Like once you commit and you're out there, you're in writing, everything is recorded. Uh, this is on going to be forever in the archives <laughs> of YouTube and Spotify and Apple. And, and so there's, a, there's some stigma in human nature of being inconsistent, right? Like we're built for congruent, congruent consistency in terms of, you know, what we say and do. So how do you, um, as, as people commit, how do you do risk the ability to change in the future? Can you do risk that? Is that just part of the life's journey? I, I think it's part of like how we evolve as humans. And so I, I think I've, I've told my, my older son who's 23 coming out of college. I'm like, buddy, you need to get on LinkedIn. He jokes. He's like, oh, mom, that's only for old people. I'm like, well, dude, that's where old people like me are hiring people like you. So you need to get out there and start to be building your your brand. He can probably only articulate that first of the four parts I talked about. What did he go to school to do? And like, what what is the functional job he's, he's you know, good at? Um, and so actually, I think you evolve and that's where you start. And then again, what you, your career pivots happen all the time. And I, so what I would tell people is acknowledge, um, you know, what at 20, I, I like, I don't know what I don't know. Right. To yeah. then I've learned something new and different and my positions on it, on it has changed or what I thought I wanted has evolved as I've grown it as a person, as I've had these lived experiences. So be strategic and intentional about how you show up, but at the same time, acknowledge when you mess up. Sometimes we might be misinformed. And so we come out publicly and say something. And I'd rather just say, you know what? I made a mistake. I've learned from it. Here's how we're moving forward. Or here's what I used to want 15 years ago. And this is where I'm going based upon this, you know, new, what brings me joy now is something different. Perfect. Well, I, this has been fascinating. Thank you for being so open. I, I've learned a lot of life relevant tips I, I did, that could be applied in in career at home um and i think this is this is beautiful part of this podcast is to to actually um help uh help our audience and through through them myself you know somewhat selfishly to figure out how we can be more human at work uh, so thank you so much victoria for sharing that if people wanted to learn more about your work your books you know how can they find you I have a website, which is victoria-peltier.com. I'm sure you'll have it in the show notes, so I won't spell that out. From there, they can link out with me on whatever other social media platform uh, of their choice. Amazing. Thank you so much, Victoria, for sharing your full self with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>